evening, everyone. I always hate breaking up a rambunctious crowd of avid arts goers and conversationalists, but there's another conversation waiting to happen that might be just as interesting, if not more so. I'm Sherry Gelden, and I am delighted to welcome all of you here this evening for a very special occasion. It is, of course, the inauguration of our new exhibition, Inherent Structure. Um, but I think I can say this in all truth, the fact checkers may yet slay me, but if I'm not mistaken, in my 25 years at the Wexner Center, I don't think we've ever had an opening with as many of the artists present. Um, it's spectacular, and I would love for you all to just stand. You'll be introduced later, but come on. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I was about to call you out on that. I'm also just thrilled to see the crowd that's here this evening. Um, our sort of May through August slot of exhibitions is always a little precarious because unfortunately it doesn't align well with the academic calendar. A couple of years ago, OSU, without asking us, went from quarters to semesters and it totally screwed with our schedule. <laughs> but nonetheless, I do see some students here, which I'm thrilled about, and definitely some faculty, so they don't all go on sabbatical in the summer. And I also just wanted to say how thrilled we are to welcome so many of the gallerists um, who have accompanied the artists here. And I think for um, many of them as well, it may be a first visit to the WEX, so hopefully not a last. And um, with that, I am going to introduce the man of the hour, Michael Goodson, our senior curator of exhibitions here. Michael has this sneaky way, I've come to learn, about proposing exhibitions. They almost always start with four to eight people in them and they end up with 16 to 37. <laughs> Go figure. Um, actually, what I really love about that is that it is the indication of a mind that is forever thinking through things, wrestling with things, making new, fresh connections along the way. When he proposes an exhibition, it's not because he has all the answers or has linked up every last possible filament in the network. Um, and it's been great fun having conversations with him along the way. Uh, last spring, some of you will recall Michael's um, group tour de force, Gray Matters. I promise you, we didn't tell him, okay, Michael, go back and do it again with a lot of color. But um, <laughs> there is something to be said for someone who can go from the achrome spectrum to a spectrum that you can't even really uh, define or kind of codify. So. Um, with that, and with great thanks to all of my colleagues here at the Wexner Center, um, it is a small but mighty team that makes amazing things happen here year-round and on stage, on screen, and in, in our galleries. Uh, but tonight, of course, is a celebration of a gallery spectacle that um, I think you're all going to find to be really, really fascinating. Michael Goodson. Um, I'm going to start with uh, two non sequiturs uh, with regard to the show that we're here for tonight and the artists that are going to speak tonight. One is uh, there, one of our preparators runs this great space uh, called No Place Gallery here in town that actually, uh, starting tomorrow, has a really interesting show that's opening up. And it's the one in a series of very interesting shows, in my estimation. His name is James McDevick Strendy, and he does a he does a really great job with this and. Um, if, if you're so inclined, uh, uh, please go to No Place Gallery. There's a group show there called As If a Field Could Become a Sum Dream. And um, I'm not going to read the list of artists because I'll, I'll certainly screw that up. But, um, uh, it, so, and the website uh, URL is um, noplacegallery.com. 
really check it out. It's, it's something special in this community. Um, uh, and the other non sequitur is um, I ran into this actor today, Mark uh, Metcalf, who played Niedermeyer in Animal House. He was like in the cafe. <laughs> Remember like the militaristic, yeah. He lives in Columbus apparently. Animal House is so ingrained in my psyche in a funny way that I was just, I think I was fawning after him the way I might after like Lou Reed or something. Um, these shows come about with the labor and work and attention, uh, a really special kind of attention of a lot of people. So if you give me just like a few minutes, I'd like to thank them. Um, I know this can get a little tedious, but they're really, uh, this is the best installation crew I think I've ever worked with. Um, uh, Nick Basso, Jake Colson, uh, Kyle Downs, Amy Flowers, who is really like a venerable part of this institution. She's been here forever. Uh, Jake Hoyer, James McDevitt Srendi, who runs No Place Gallery. Uh, Mars Wrighthouse. Ethan Schaefer, uh, Scott Short, and uh, uh, James Stephanopoulos. Um, all, I mean, incredible installers. And uh, give the work such care. And also, they have great eyes. Most of them are artists, um, which is often the case with preparators. Uh, I'd like to thank our design engineer, Steve Jones, who's also been here uh, forever. Um, uh, the assistant exhibition designer is James Maracle and Nick Stull, and uh, our, the brilliant installation manager, Dave Dickus. Uh, those three guys, um, along with uh, head registrar, Kim Col Coleman, and Allison Banger, uh, really make these shows happen. Uh, also, the administrative assistant, uh, Teresa Tomei. Teresa, I promise that my receipts are forthcoming from my last trip. Uh, We have an incredible gallery guide for this show, and unfortunately, we nearly made smoke come out of the ears of our editor, Ryan Schaefer. Uh, so thank you, Ryan. Um, I promise not to give you an aneurysm going forward. Um, or I'm gonna try, anyway. Brian Bellog is the principal designer on this gallery guide, thanks. Uh, Brian, Brian. Brandon Bellog is the principal designer on this uh, gallery guide. Thank you, Brandon. It's beautiful. Um, I have two, we have, we have two uh, curatorial assistants that work here. Lucy Zimmerman, Marissa Espy. Uh, both are brilliant. Both have contributed to this gallery guide in really incredible ways. Um, uh, I think in essence they're kind of better writers than I am. And um, I really appreciate what they've given to this and, and uh, the way they've devoted themselves to these projects. Um, Megan Cavanaugh, Director of Exhibitions Management, is a force to be reckoned with in this universe, and uh, none of this would happen without her. Thanks, Megan, very much. Uh, Bill Horgan is our curator at large, and Sherry Gelden, our director. If, if two people could embody kind of the spirit of a place, I would say it's you two people, and uh, thanks for your input and thoughts and guidance. Um, uh, Rebecca Morris is an artist based in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm gonna read this, but th I'm gonna say things too. <laughs> uh, Morris, has been the, Morris has been the subject of multiple exhibitions in recent years, including the Whitney Biennial in 2014. <clears throat> this incredible show in 2016 at the Hammer called Made in LA, um, uh, and solo presentations at uh, a 356 mission, which sadly is, incredibly sadly for me, is closing soon. Um, uh, she's represented by Barbara Weiss Gallery in Berlin and Corbett versus Dempsey in Chicago. Um, Rebecca was among the first artists that I thought about for this show, and it's painting that I have uh, thought about, struggled with in a funny way. Um, I'm still attempting to completely understand it, uh, and I, I love that. I love a thing that doesn't just present itself, you know, and I, and I, I really 
appreciate those paintings that way. Um, uh, Laura Owens, uh, who is from Ohio, as is a lot of a lot of the artists in the show are from Ohio. Weirdly, um, uh, Laura Owens is a is a native of Ohio, and I think that like forty members of her family are here. Uh, <laughs> they're this entire section. Um, uh, Laura has been the subject of a major uh, mid uh, or career survey at the uh, Whitney Museum of American Art. It has now traveled and is currently at the Dallas Museum of Art and will go to SF MoMA after that. Um, she has had solo exhibitions, uh, really the work in this show is cold from her solo exhibition at uh, CCA, the Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts in San Francisco in 2016. Uh, she did an incre incredible show at Secession Vienna in the year before that in 2015. Um, also lives and works in Los Angeles um, and is the founder, along with Wendy Yao and Gavin Brown, of uh, what I think is one of the finest spaces um, at, at 356 Mission, uh, which again, um, without going into it, is, I'm very sad about its closing. Uh, um, she's represented by Gavin Brown Enterprise in Harlem, New York. Um, Ruth Root, uh, his recent solo exhibitions include presentation at 356 Mission uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut, the Hood Museum of Art in Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, her work has been included in recent group solo exhibitions at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. Is that show still open? Yes. That show's still open if you're in New York. Um, and uh, the Albright Knox in Buffalo, and Ruth is represented by Andrew Kreps Gallery in New York. Um, moderating tonight is uh, um, George Rush, who's associate professor of, in the Department of Art and teaches painting and drawing here at OSU. Um, he has exhibited internationally since 2001 with solo shows in Copenhagen, Madrid, Miami, New York, Texas, Ohio, and Michigan. One of those shows was, I think, my show, the show we did together. Um, George is also the, one of the smartest, funniest people I know. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Rebecca Morris, Laura Owens, Ruth Root, and George Rush. Thanks. Can you hear us? Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sherry, and everyone. Um, we were told that we can get right into this. And uh, to prepare, the four of us had dinner last night and talked about what we wanted to talk about. And it was pretty wide ranging, and a lot of things uh, were sort of um, unclear still uh, by the end of that uh, dinner. But I, I came away thinking that I definitely wanted to continue to, um, I really wanted us to focus on your paintings and, uh, and, and abstract painting. And um, so I, I happened to, upon this, this uh, New York Times book review of The Road to Unfreedom by um, Margaret Macmillan, and I'm just gonna read one quote from that because it, it reminded me of some of the things that we were talking about. Uh, so Macmillan writes, so many of us no longer care, as we should, about understanding ourselves and our parts as complex and ambiguous. Rather, we look for comforting stories that claim to explain where we came from and where we are going. Such stories relieve us of the need to think and serve to create powerful identities. They also serve the authoritarian leader who rides them to power. And in our long dinner conversation last night, the three of you often returned to the importance of abstract painting as an activity that does not support comforting stories. That painting and art can be a field in which complex and ambiguous, uh, uh, are, the complex and the ambiguous are necessary qualities. And so I'd like us to talk about, um, if we can, uh, your continued commitment to abstract painting. Um, and how its importance as something as a as a field where uh, ambiguity and openness and uh, um, experimentation, et cetera, is is uh, is is part of it. Uh, 
and we can go any way with this. <laughs> the three of you all, uh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say that I thought of myself as a more traditional abstract painter before this body of work. Is this on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, before this body of work that's up now that will come up in a minute. And I think that to me was abstract painting. And now I think of my work as a variation on abstract painting or a sculptural as abstract painting or a expanded abstract painting. And what are the qualities that make it expanded or um, sculptural? Um, I think before I had pretty traditional ideas of a figure ground relationship and a wall relationship uh, and a concealed mechanism. And now I think these new paintings deal with a exposed mechanism and a, a whole different thing, but of course are to be read as abstract paintings. Mm -hmm. With that, um, this is Ruth, everybody. With, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I was just, I guess I'm just going to repeat what we, I said upstairs. I'll try to paraphrase it that I consider myself an abstract painter because I'm more concerned with the how things get made as opposed to what I'm choosing to start with or what it might look like. Um, uh, and I guess I think the how question is sort of more intrinsic and more interesting to me sometimes, so. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, as I think there's different veins of uh, histories of abstraction and where they come from, you know. Uh, some lead through conceptual art, some do not, you know. Some are strictly modernist. And um, we were talking about abstract those people who name themselves abstract painters or abstractionists or think in terms of abstraction as like, there's a whole group of people that I would think are interested in, in making a system that talks in an, into itself mm -hmm. and, and is of its own self. And you need to kind of enter into this world that the person has created in order to understand what it is you're looking at. Like, so you need to see usually more than one of their works to understand what it is, the context for what you're looking at. Rich might be a good example of that, where you have to see more than one. I don't think you, I mean, I feel like it expands out, but a lot of people do that. Rich Aldrich, who's another one of the artists in the show who doesn't like to stand, yeah. he, <laughs> but now has gotten more attention for not standing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely an abstract painter. <laughs> um, I mean, there was a time in uh, grad school, at the end of grad school and a little bit after grad school that I sort of experimented with more collage or doing everything you could to make a painting without paint. And I really enjoyed making work that way and it was really helpful, but it sort of just brought me back to painting more and I think given the time period I was doing that in, which was the early 90s, it felt at that point more radical to actually go back to just trying to make a painting in the strictest way, canvas, stretcher bar, oil paint. And I think there's, I've continued to feel that there's so much there to work with and it feels like the constraint of that feels more free than for me in my hands than opening it up to other things. Something you, in the quote you were reading at the beginning that I also said upstairs that struck me was this idea of, did, did you use the word master narrative in there or am I putting that in there? But there was something in the quote where you were just talking about a kind of way of looking at things that becomes the one way and I think what I like about abstraction is that it's um, disrupting that a lot. And I've thought about this when I'm talking about my work in contexts where it's just me and I'm giving a lecture to students or however. And I'm always trying to think of a way to talk about my work that doesn't maybe just go through it chronologically because that tends to, to kind of 
simplify how things happened and you can get really good at doing that talk well and then you sort of gloss over all the stuff that was out of the narrative which is actually more important than this narrative that you tell so it simplifies it so i'm been trying lately to when I give these talks to figure out how to do them better, how to make them more real, how to make them more authentic, and how to make them more true to how I make the work instead of a story that seems kind of canned by the end and then you give the lecture and you just feel kind of awful. It can get really rote. Uh, yeah, it's really hard. I have also come to the conclusion, this is sort of ten, yeah. similar to what you're saying, that I've tell myself stories to get started to make a painting. Mm. And they're, it's a story of like, I wanna paint a picture of a dog. It's like, oh, or I, I'm gonna respond to the space. Or, but this is really just a story that I'm saying to give myself permission to just do stuff that is completely irrational. Mm -hmm. There's no real rational reason to get up in the morning and make a painting, mm -hmm. you know? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, so I, it's like yeah. you tell yourself a story, and I think that's how stories become important, but when you sit on them and depend on them, and it is, does have this false feeling. Yeah. Yeah, and the process for me is really just fooling around with stuff until something emerges, and then it's an unknown thing often, and uh, the process itself is abstract. <laughs> Yeah. Too. I, I feel like I've watched you. We all know each other really well. Yeah. We've known each other for 25 years. I no. Think 20, 20, since 20. 93. What time? What day? Um, I met Ruth in 91. I met you in 94. That, and that, we have photographs this? to yeah. prove it, right? <laughs> yeah. And we, need to it, we all met at Skowhegan, and three other alum are in the audience. Hi, Scott Reeder, James Franklin, Sheila Pepe. <laughs> Where's James Franklin? Right here. Oh. <laughs> if there's was other she, alum that I'm missing. Wait, was Sheila Pepe at the party at the Club Van Gogh? She was. That's oh, really? We had that discussion she mentioned, right? The last party. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Is your foot in there, Sheila? <laughs> Skowhegan is famous for its parties, and I guess this was a particularly memorable one. It is really interesting to think that it was the early 90s and you all went towards, or mid, you know, mid 90s, and that you all found each other, but also uh, were invested in becoming abstract painters or being abstract painters, because I don't know how many people here know this, but abstract painting wasn't really like the cool thing to do in the 90s. Um, and, can you talk a little bit about how you came to that? Um, how you found abstract? I had thing? no idea. Wait, Rebecca, I think you had a lot of stickers in your work. I there. did. That was yeah, that, that experimental non-painting part. That was like yeah. I think I was a text artist at the time, right? No, no. <laughs> I remember. No, you were making it. You had so many little paintings. I was gonna say this before I started talking about how well we know yeah. each other. Is that when you say you work and work, and then something comes out of the process? Yeah. That's I don't true. think anyone here can imagine how much Ruth works on something until she finds the thing she wants to make. Like, yeah. I, I feel like, like it's to, it like can be years. I know. It, <laughs> and she'll really, and you'll yeah. be like, Ruth, that looks amazing. And then she's like, but it's just not quite right. And then you come back, and she has made something better, but it's just like, I know. These... I feel like I really have noticed that about myself because my studio's in my house, and I really love yeah. to putter around and look at something and make it and remake yeah. it. And even now with these fabric pieces, they're all a lot of them are getting destroyed through showing because they're not completely archival and I kind of I like to remake them even mm -hmm. I I mean I like the process of making new things but I also just love kind of that discovery that happens from but I remember you coming to Skowhegan and having like 50 canvases and being you were like working so hard you had like a bunch of I little I things on the floor paper I don't know Laura and I were right next door to each other, so we could hear everything and talk over the, the barrier all day. 
Right? Yeah. yeah. And we were roommates. I was oh, a, yeah, I'm sure I was roommates. a horrible roommate. Oh, no, you weren't. <laughs> Our other roommate was horrible. Oh. What? <laughs> what was wrong? She... Oh, she would. This is boring, right? She, but she would like, set her alarm every day oh, and yeah, press sleep. Yeah. <laughs> like she had like a fancy BMW, and she'd drive up to her studio and oh, never yeah. give us rides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was maybe it was an Audi. I remember it had something to do with her sleeping too much or something. It was, it was crazy. Not cool. Never be to be heard from again. <laughs> however, she, she's, uh, no. If this is yeah. live streamed, <laughs> she is probably yeah. making something amazing right. in she, a BMW. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> and Lord, you were working on one painting. A oh, lot of the paintings. time. Oh, two paintings, yeah. <laughs> it was big. I had some ambitious yeah. ideas. I had like five by six foot paintings that I brought there. And you yeah. drove in a truck I, with Monique Prieto. Yeah. yeah. All the way across the country. Yeah. With the empty, with the raw and a pickup truck, and and an then... S10 pickup truck, and she was four months pregnant. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. So this... <laughs> <laughs> this is not what we talked about talking about, but it's... Yeah. <laughs> It is, it's way more interesting than anything I could have imagined. But we do uh, work in really different ways. Yeah. That's yeah. one thing. I know yeah. Ruth is I'm someone Sanford who's... I'm son. <laughs> 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 Laura is... <laughs> Laura has it uh... I have no idea. You, t you, you know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Rebecca, I was, when I came to your studio, I was so amazed that some of those... Paintings really have just one pass of paint, like oh, that yeah. you're present and you're making those paintings the first time instead of, yeah. you know, planning and cross and painting yeah. over, over, over. And, you, you know, that is out. something that I feel like is really <laughs> just amazing to me. Yeah. And then, Thanks. and Do there's not so many, or the mess ups, if there are any, become Gotta part of it. something else. Yeah. yeah. Are they are they very improvisational? Do you make there are, drawings? It's a, it's, it, there are is a lot of improvisation, but there's it can't exist as improvisation alone, or it doesn't hold my attention. There have to be there have to be decisions, and then moments that go backwards, or you know, are totally different, or and then they come back again. So it's all the paintings don't take long to make, actually, in the sense that. Um, to physically make them. The part that is slow is the decision making and the mm. thinking. So sometimes they take a really long time because I'm trying to figure out what to do next. And it can be just like a kind of mark or a kind of color or a kind of area I want to put in. And then sometimes I just don't know for a very long time. And then I figure it out and do it. Do you see it in your mind before you do it? I mm. think I do, and then the minute I start, all bets are off because mm -hmm. you have to exist with whatever starts happening. So I may have thought I was going to do something, and then the first mark goes down, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's good. That's where... I tried to make... I tried to analyze how I make a decision because mm -hmm. I started noticing, like, I would get up out of a chair. I would... I usually have a sketchbook or a piece of paper, and I'd take notes and stuff, and I would write, like, something, okay, I'm going to do this. I have some blank canvas, and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to... I'd draw a square and draw some yeah. cat or something. And I'd stand up and walk across the room with whatever material I was about to do that thing, and another thing would happen. Yeah. And I was just, I was trying really hard to track where did I make the decision. Like, a decision had to happen in order for me to get out of the chair and get to the thing, but then something else takes over, and it's like... A bunch of other decisions happen really fast. That I yeah, it's just like you need like an ignition. Yeah, one ignites the and then yeah, and then it, it just yeah. goes. Yeah, and that's I think that's an interesting part about being a, at least a painter is like you. Yeah, and just being that responsive all the time. Yeah, and yeah, not just following through because that was the idea you had. Mm -hmm. You, it's always about trying to make the best thing at that moment. So that's the goal as best as you can. Rebecca, do you also have a part of your practice that is the unstretched canvas that mm -hmm. is yeah, like a collection of the studio uh -huh. marks and then is... Can and you, then I stretch it later. Because I feel like one is one way and then the other... Then like, there are some there's that are some really... That are, <laughs> they're projected because they're too big for me to draw them because I can't physically... Because they're so big that I oh, run out of yeah. body and then I can't... I'm too close to see. So I have to do these, so there's paintings that are projected drawings 
And then once the drawing is projected, it's so large from the scale that was like this that I then I redraw parts because the scale shift. And then there's ones I just make up all the way from the start. And then there are these tarp paintings. Yeah, the, can you talk about the tarp paintings? I feel like they're kind of... I started putting white paper down on my floor a long time ago because I was painting on the flat. And I liked the white paper because it neutralized the whole space so I wasn't paying attention to the architecture. It was, you know, like paint, mixing paint on a white palette. So it put white paper down. And then, of course, you see all these, like, great accidental weirdo marks that happen yeah. from cleaning your brush. And so it was, you know, so I just put canvas down to catch all that. Mm -hmm. And then it was just a nice way to make a painting. And, I mean, this is... I did not invent this. A million people do this, where you kind of try to enfold the studio detritus back in. And it's, you know, when you're thinking about how to make a painting all the time and you're coming at it so forwardly, it's like fucking exhausting. And so if you can be secretly making a painting without trying and suddenly it's halfway done, it's such a relief. Yeah. And then you just respond to it. Yeah. But you made it. So right. it's just a different way of making that just kind of helps. And I, I find that... I really want to make as many paintings as I can in as many different ways because all of that difference is stimulating to everything that's happening. So all of it's important. I, I can see that in your work sometimes, like what's under, what's on top, yeah. what are the ones that are so lightly done and just seem like they're... And the more I've noticed over the 20 years <laughs> that sometimes you have like a like almost like a test painting and then a final mm -hmm. painting or at least with like the monkeys and the yeah like I'll make like so 25 effortless and tests so yeah. completely freely done but then behind that is like the memory of your yeah. hand from all the testing and all the sketches yeah I try to I think some of the best paintings I've made is when I feel like I'm a student Mm -hmm. Again, and I'm teaching myself how to make a painting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's just like kind of gearing up to do it and figuring out what all the parts are and how I'm going to... I might teach myself a new technique, a new material, a new right. way or something, some new idea. that. But I'm always... Like you're saying, the marks that are caught on the floor, is some, it's some way of making without your deliberation being in the way or something. And I'm always trying to consciously circumvent a habit that I've yeah. had. Like, so mm -hmm. if I'm painting animals, knowing that I'm using them as surrogates for a human figure, I'll force myself, even though I don't want to, like paint the human figure somehow. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. And I think there's something, especially at a certain point when you're an artist and you've been making work for a chunk of time, mm -hmm. you can kind of feel like you know how to do your thing. And so the, there's right. this whole air time where you're just trying to undo it or short circuit yourself and that becomes really important or a, a way to make it a different way or to surprise yourself or disrupt something. Right. Um, Do you, f looking at the, I don't know if everyone's seen the show, but looking at the five or six paintings of yours, uh, Rebecca, there, um, I'm asking this because I, it feels like the two, of, uh, Laura and, and Ruth, your works are sort of of uh, more concise series. I mean, clearly Laura's is from like one piece, right? But um, there's a huge variation of stuff going on in those paintings of yours, Rebecca. And were they all made at the same time, around the same time, or do you work in batches, or do you sort of shift mode from painting to painting? Um, they, they, I think they were all made in the same two years. They're all from different shows, right? Or were some yeah, shows they, they may have some, yeah, yeah they're two from, I think they're from the Made in LA show and then a show I did, a solo show I did last year in Germany. Um, so yeah, but, but, but you could take a group of, that's how I would do a show even if it was all new work coming from my studio. It's not that it's so differing because it comes from different shows. It's just, in fact, that was one thing we had to figure out is how are we gonna, at one point a selection for this exhibition wasn't varied enough and things were sort of mm. wilting. And at what point in your, I mean, that's, I think that's such an interesting condition of your work, that there's this incredible variation, that there's this sort of shifting modes. Um, do you think about it? Like, how do you think about it? Um, I only think about it when you, people ask, like, now. Yeah. 
I mean, Laura does this all the time, but it's just maybe, you know, different bodies of work doing this, but there's yeah. so much yeah. like this mm -hmm. in your work too. I think maybe it just looks... A, just completely start over with a bigger shift with like, yeah. okay, now I'm gonna do this, but and that's like the starting point is totally different. And one thing I was, we went to New York for her opening at the Whitney, and one thing I was really excited about seeing was how Laura was gonna figure out how to do a survey show of work that was so exhibition specific. Not all of it, but a lot of it was. Wow, and I was I like, how too. is she gonna wow. do it? And then how is she gonna do that show and then also make it the survey show, which is the other thing. Mm -hmm. And I left feeling like she nailed it. And I mean, I think maybe I didn't really tell you this, but I was so impressed <laughs> because I think the survey show, the mid-career survey show is very challenging and I, think it's really hard to make that a show without it just being a sort of nostalgia trip. And then I thought you reinvented all those moments in a way that fit together in the context of a mid-career show and I was really just super impressed and I, I, I don't know if, I, I was like, I'm not doing one of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just felt like, you just made yeah. it and threw away the key. Like that was how you do it. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. You it won. Is, it's really hard. Totally. I mean, we worked on the installation for like two years. Yeah. Because there's a there's an impulse to just make a project out of your all your work. Yeah. Like Maurizio Catalan did at the Guggenheim, where he's just like hanging it all up in a, and you make a new piece out of it that's just like, kind of destroys all the older pieces. So it was like how to make it alive, but not do that. Not like. And not Take a journalistic, from, yeah, yeah, and not like a just a, yeah. Well, uh, were you tempted to make a new piece out of all the new out of when all it the old seemed work? really hard? Yeah. I was just like, let's make one wall and just shove everything on it. You know, and <laughs> Scott's like, I'm not gonna let you do that to your work. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, something that um, upstairs you guys shared with me was your. Description that Jessica Stockholder for you early on was like oh, standing yeah. in a painting, like being, you know, being in a Jessica Stockholder installation or sculpture was like being in a painting. And then I think we were all three of us sort of thinking the Wattis exhibition. But for me, the survey was also had this feeling of like, I'm in Laura's mind. Yeah. Like, you know, this is, you know, this kind of incredible, because you didn't just represent shows or, you know, you also then took that and torqued it or played with it, integrated the entire museum itself as, as, as a part. Um, and one of the moments I was most sort of impressed by, shocked by, and still sort of confused by was the um, alphabet paintings behind the wall. And can you just share with us a little bit about that? Because it's such a, I thought, really exciting and still confounding well, kind of move. that piece is made to be the most like kind of mutable piece. Like you can show one or you can show all of them. You can hang them any way you want. You can make words, you cannot make words. Um, so that piece in particular has built into it like this idea, a, a kind of playful idea to it with the installation. So I mean, I think as a metaphor, it worked like to say, you know, you're not ever gonna see it all or you know, you're, you're not, you can't have point, your point of view is always limited, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I also thought like, okay, it, it's a traveling survey and there'll be another venue and this one will come out and something else will get removed and, you know, like, so. Sort of like a painting, a series yeah, of paintings, right? Um, it's, it's hard for me to explain, it felt right to me to do that, to kind of show, a, show something obliquely also was something I've always been thinking about, like how you see something in your periphery but you're looking at another painting head on mm -hmm. and that those two experiences happen at the same time and you need to admit that they're happening and not like pretend it's not happening. Um, a lot of times with painting or the history of painting, the one of the problems is to privilege this sort of like one point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like I'm always trying to think about point of view and subjectivity and how, like the, the piece on the eighth floor 
which was a five part piece that you had like a few piece points of view where it, an anamorphic projection would come together, but like you, you, the viewer became, your body becomes an integral part in understanding like different points of view and it making the piece. It reminds me of Baroque painting in some ways. Uh, you know, whether it's the ceiling of Il Jesu or Caravaggio's, um, you know, Cycle of Saint Matthew, where you know, as as the viewer, as the body, you're activated in this space, and you have to kind of like constant. You're constantly reminded that you're sort of you don't have command over the entire artwork. Right. I yeah. I mean, I think. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a good it's a good metaphor for being a human. Like you often think, because we're stuck in these singular bodies, we think, "Oh, my experience is true." You know, when there's multiple experiences, multiple bodies, your position can shift, your being can shift, you age. You know, things happen. So it's like it, to to remember that there's not one point of view is like important, and I think to lift that as a problem from painting and sort of say like it's because I think that is one of the historical problems of painting like and I think it's so you know most of the works that we're talking about are made by you in the studio you know standing there perhaps or sitting in front of it without an audience or without other bodies and then we I, at least in my experience making work, I'm always imagining them in a space without other bodies necessarily in them, right? Some kind of like strange, idealized, magical space where the painting is. And then we photograph them in these empty galleries. And so to me, it's such an interesting issue to like really reinsert the body of the viewer as sort of a condition of the work. And um, maybe this is a confusing way to ask this question, but we, one of the things we talked about last night was painting for installation, or not, not necessarily for installation, but taking installation conditions of display, et cetera, as, and, and the apparatus of the gallery as part of the, of the making of, of the work. And all three of you, I think, deal with that really differently, so and, maybe we can And I think painting has, too, and just people forget. Like, people, like, if you think about the Armory show, or you think about Dada shows, or you think about even that photograph of Barnett Newman, with his nose up against the painting. I mean, so it it's had this, it's just that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when conceptual art sort of like had this sort of hegemonic new world order of like. Mind over body. Yeah, mind over body. It, it sort of pigeonholed painting as not having considered this, but anyway. I just think, do paintings have to be a certain size to function like this or can they? Mm -hmm. Can smaller paintings, like all the, I was just thinking all the paintings in the show mm -hmm. upstairs are so big. <laughs> and the relationship that you have with them is of, you know, of really being a body instead of just being eyes looking. And, you know, like I feel like when I'm reading a book, I'm eyes. And when I'm looking at a painting, I'm a or these type of paintings, I'm a body, and when you're an installation, you're, you move around like a body. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that relates to anything, but that was just... I think um, totally, and in your own work, the way sheen and various material effects, uh, or not effects, but like material affects the, the body, I think is very, very well, important. I have found with my work, I lately need it to be big and slightly it has to be experienced as this weight, uh, a heavy thing that's kind of like a portal. Like they can't be small for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering. Well, it feels like it gives you more room to have all the parts and to have these sort of sections and the, the vocabulary that right. you're using gets more space to, to really be repeated. And you have things that like a, it's a pattern or a, rep, a reproduction within it. And it, you can see that happening more when we get a bigger expanse. Right. Um, yeah. I just think the scale, when you go big, you're just literalizing space. Mm. So that's very successful right off the bat. But then I think a lot of geometric 
work, whether it's abstract or not, just naturally wants to kind of fall into an architectural, you know, relationship because architecture is usually geometric in some way or there's things that relate. So that's, I think about that. None, none of my work site specific, but in how it's installed, I'll completely like, if there's some weird light switch nearby and there's something in the painting that I think is vibing with it, I get excited about that. It, mm -hmm. it, it's like something to take advantage of instead of trying to make invisible. I was really interested when you talked about the limits of the sort of, of your own gesture and so then needing to project in order to kind of make what you need and how, um, you know, it, that, that seems to be such a kind of um, wonderful, like, turn from like the kind of humanist like project of like the body you know de Kooning or something like oh it's my size it's man size it's like arm size and instead saying like no this is world size or this is this mm -hmm. other size and and um thinking about painting in LA as you know I'm, I'm also interested in where you all work and and how you all you know how that might influence what what you make not that it's representational of your everyday life, but the scale of LA is really different than the scale of New York. And um, I, I feel like the crowdedness of New York is like, to me, like, to me your paintings feel a little bit like Canal Street or something, old Canal Street, you know. Um, now it's probably empty and <laughs> like coffee. Um, but maybe can you, we, we were talking a little bit about California light and I thought that was a really, really interesting point that you made, could you, could we maybe talk a bit about like what the conditions are that where you all make your work? Well, if I was an artist in New York, I couldn't afford the studio I need to make the work I want to make. So that's a luxury in California. I think it's expensive, but it's not as expensive. Um, and I do think there's something about the light there after living there for 20 years it's very yellow and very bleaching at times, and I've had studios where I had a southern facing bank of windows, and so from like 11 to five, it would just be almost impossible to see color, and it would be glowing. It would be like golden hour continuously, which was really beautiful, and I think that that was a time when things got paler and paler and paler. Not in a way that was negative, I just, it occurred to me that that was what it was doing. And then I think there's a very fresco surface in my paintings too, and there's just so much stucco and concrete everywhere and you get used to seeing that. And um, I mean, none of it's really on purpose. It's not like, oh, I, I'm on the freeway, I'm gonna make a painting that's like the freeway. I mean, it's not like that. It's just that these things just creep in in organic ways. So if it, when it gets proposed, I'm like, huh, maybe. This idea of like the ache of bright was something that it's in a poem that someone wrote about my work and used this um, part of a poem to talk about this. And I was like, yeah, that's it. This like, it hurts. It's so uh, diffused and, and um, transparent. It's hard to locate it. Op it's hard to locate optically like yeah. where the image sits in your paintings for me. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a soft I think haze, that's that but they're also look. really concrete. You the know? fresco look maybe very stained, mm -hmm. very thin. Laura, your work seems to be increasingly um, <laughs> in the realm of the desktop. Is that a fair assessment? No. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Did you, see the, <laughs> did you see the show I did in London in 2017? <laughs> I can't remember. Because. I'm like a stalker. I know everything. Going on here. I didn't. So let me approach this a different way. <laughs> um, the influence of digital technology and the screen has clearly become for all of us of our generation like more and more a part of our everyday life. And um, how do you see that in in your in your work? Um, well, the first time I was using the computer a lot to make my work was just after CalArts, because Monique, who 
we said had the S10 pickup who we drove. She's a painter. She was pregnant, and she didn't want to use toxic materials, so she forked over the money to get this a new painter program. It was actually called Painter. Um, and I got a copy of it, and we both were using it. She wanted to be able to easily draw and make plans without using toxic material, then like go figure out how to make it very quickly. And But I just started fooling around with it and making prints, and I just u realized that it's just another tool that is used um, in the studio, just as much as you're gonna write an email about can you, pay, can you pay for my plane ticket to get to the show? And you're gonna look at like a million colors and pick out which exact green it is you're thinking of and like have it on the screen to kind of reference to. Um, it's like a tool, you know? Um, and then from there, I just used it more and more with a painter and then I switched over to Photoshop because it was like a little bit easier to use. Um, um, and then I started making etching with Crown Point Press um, and got into etching and realized that the people who made these programs must have been thinking about the way etching is made because it's you use copper plates that you make an image on and you basically, if you're doing like more traditional color etching, you're gonna use CMYK, different channels on the plates and combine colors. Um, and this is exactly how the structure of these th things. So I started thinking about it as just being the legacy of printmaking, just as much as in it not starting with, um, you know, anything to do with the digital or whatever that means. I don't really know, but um, since it's there in the studio, yeah, like you find things, you do things with it, and like you're like, oh, let's try to make that. And what, there was one time because I have a hard time starting. I had made a bunch of prints like in the '90s of like just like kind of doodles I had made on the screen and I had not gotten started with the show and I was like, I don't know what to make. And my mom was like, why don't you just make that? And it was like a printout, a glossy, just eight by 10 printout. And so I took this printout and I said, and I translated it back into analog in my mind. Like, oh, that's probably this kind of paint and that's probably this kind of paint. But I hadn't made it with the intention of thinking this is gonna be a painting. So then, that idea came forward. But I have been using projectors. You know, the Andy Warhol, everybody uses projectors. You know, I mean, David Hockney has that whole thing about the, oh, I don't remember what it's called. The, yeah. secret, knowledge the secret knowledge. I mean, it's like, it's in the history yeah. of painting and printmaking. And so I just see it as part of the same thing. And that when you get tripped up and say, oh, we've entered the digital age. And, you know, I think if I have students, I tell them they need, to learn these programs and stuff, because it's just like, it's it's like learning how to mix color. You need to be able to have access to like, change an image. Like, so I, because a lot of times I'll make a drawing, a hand drawing, scan it, and then change it, you know, instead of erasing and redrawing, you know, or put collage in it through. Mm -hmm. We used to and do, you this do on that. the Xerox machine. I mean, yeah. yeah, the Xerox machine, you'd use it all the time in the same way. Right. I, I've always, um, I mean, this, I, in no way am I thinking of it in a pejorative sense, right? Like, I think painting has always moved forward by responding to things outside of it. You know, uh, Baroque painting, sculpture, uh, 19th century painting, photography, um, you know, 20th century painting, philosophy. I don't know, uh, you know, um, and, and now, uh, but I, I can't help but to, to think that the computer ha and and printing and uh, in your in your work, uh, Ruth, um, the the printed material that's part of the aperture, or part of the mechanism that holds up the paintings. Is that mm -hmm. right? Like they hang by these yeah, cloth. Yeah, they hang by a digitally produced fabric. But I guess I think of it in a way the way that Laura thinks of it. It's just a tool to make something you want to make. Like you're sort of figuring out the means in which to make it and. It's just yet another way that's ingrained into our brain about thinking about images and thinking about uh, even just a quick way to figure something out is often through Photoshop. Yeah. And I was just gonna say that when you had your show at 356 in this past year, one thing, you know, these works are different from previous bodies of work with how they're made and, you know, the fastening and the different materials combined. Yeah. And 
and they are really different, but one thing I was just really powerfully struck by was how inherently they were yours through the whole time I've known your work. And I was just like awestruck by your language I coming through. I have through. a weird thing that I tried to change my work from those other abstract paintings, and then it's just like, it came out again. I was so sick of my old work. I was, I was just done. It was just as if every single combination of that type of painting, these were the paintings on aluminum that I But even had the done. work before that, like, like I know it just keeps like coming through it's me. It's so I impressive. I'm really I mean, like it's like what everybody wants, you know? I guess it's so it's like I want to make something different. I and you I feel are. like I am making you something are. different you now are, and I so I like incredible. my new work so much more and I'm into it. But it's funny now, it's starting to seem like it's an it's the same thing or or like the parallel universe and yet the same thing. Mm. So um, I was impressed by it. Thanks, Rebecca. I was like <laughs> that makes me thanks. Well, we've we've sort of done it. Uh, we've talked for almost an hour and we haven't strayed from painting. So um, we, we kind of have to wrap it up. But I think that that thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.